Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Purple Insider. Matthew Collar here. And look who's back. Eric Eager of Sumer Sports. You knew that there had to be a podcast coming between myself and Eric after Kirk Cousins chose the Atlanta Falcons. So we got to get into Justin Jefferson's narratives and negotiations, which are getting a little out of control. It's like people got bored already after two days of uh, Vikings moves and things like that. So now they've turned on to former tight ends who are really good on Madden starting rumors on Twitter uh, and so forth. So we'll get into that. Also, the cost of trading up, whether it's actually worth it analytically, want to discuss that as well. But let's just start off, Eric, with the Vikings plan. We have talked about it so many times. I feel like uh, the entire time you and I have known each other and done podcasts, we have always been talking about this bigger front office perspective. And for it to come to fruition with Cousins leaving to Atlanta, them getting a quote bridge quarterback in Sam Darnold, getting cap space, spending that cap space immediately to rebuild their defense. I feel like this is a major step in the plan that seemed like it was laid out from the beginning for Kwesi Adafo Mensa. Yeah, and I think that that was always why you and I reserved judgment until he got to get rid of Kirk Cousins. Um, and, you know, and he, he, he got to take over a team that because his predecessor, you know, wasn't, you know, didn't finish strong, but wasn't a complete disaster left him with the Justin Jefferson, the future Hall of Fame wide receiver, Christian Derrissaw, Brian O'Neill, a good enough team to compete with that he had to deal with Kirk Cousins in that big contract for all those years. Now they get to the end of the road, right? They are taking on the most dead money currently in the NFL, so they still have to deal with that. But you start to see now this team is starting to have the, the fingerprints of Kwesi Adafo Mensa. They go out and they get Jonathan Grenard, who – uh, is kind of that ascending player. I think about back when Brad Childress took over with, uh, you know, Fran Foley, but, you know, also the Zygmunt Wolf beginnings when they went out and got, you know, Bobby Wade, Vasante Shanko, uh, Chester Taylor, guys who were kind of second contract guys s- just starting their ascent that people kind of had. No one in this who listens to this podcast heard of Jonathan Grenard before last year. And so, but he has a good year last year. Quasi goes and gets him for less than $20 million a year, which is the going rate for a great edge player, and they're banking on him. Andrew Van Ginkle, same thing. He's going to come in, very similar idea. Now they have two guys that can rush the passer with alacrity, and they haven't had that since Everson Griffin left. So that's that's a great start to, to the whole thing. They go get Brian Cashman, who I know has, you know, has fell in the draft because he has short arms, but he's going to pair with Ivan Pace, another small linebacker, and they're going to be able to move around uh, and that's going to, again, the, the fingerprints, all of Cashman's data looks really good. Again, Adolfo Mensa being an evidence-based GM going to making that move. And now you start to see again, you know, Sam Darnold, where, you know, Sam Darnold, a top three pick, what do, you know, hedge fund managers slash asset traders, slash, they buy low and sell high. Well, Sam Darnold is the quintessential buy low on an asset that once was a pretty coveted asset that the New York Jets once traded, you know, a bunch of draft picks to move up to three to get him. Now they bring him in as the bridge. And so you start to see kind of the fingerprints of, of what Quasi wants to do. And it was never possible with Kirk Cousins here to fully see uh, what Quasi wanted to do with his team. And now it's kind of fun to see that. And uh, I think that now, you know, if you are somebody who is inclined to root for him, the, the general manager and head coach, Quasi uh Kevin O'Connell. Now I think you can fully embrace it. If you were somebody who is inclined not to root for him, you can fully embrace that too, because it's, I think this is finally the, this new regime now two years in, this is finally the, the actual uh, manifestation of what these two want to do. Right. This is not them completing the journey from start to finish. That maybe will come uh, in April when they draft a quarterback or also when they actually win something because that has to happen as well with this plan. But what you wanted out of them in a regime 
is for it to be moving in the direction that it seems like they laid out and seems like makes logical sense. When you see a regime, a front office, making haphazard type of moves, that we're just bringing in this guy at random or that guy, and that's supposed to be the final answer, or they're panicking, or they're desperate to make something work, and we saw that with Spielman and Zimmer, then you go, okay, I don't know if this front office is on the same page with their ownership. I don't know if they have a real plan uh, to actually succeed. And for all of this to seemingly lead to this moment of not going all in on Kirk Cousins, that was what they appeared to lay out from day one, when the words competitive rebuild were thrown out there, a lot of us made fun of it. A lot of us said, like, what is that even supposed to mean? And you wrote an article breaking it down, how difficult it is to split the difference between being in the middle, staying competitive, getting to the top, never fully tearing it down. And even Kwesi Adafo has admitted that's a difficult thing to do. But so far to this point, they have been able to do that. They have been able to move on from expensive players, bring in younger players, bring in players now in their prime and these three defensive guys that they drafted. And as far as the Sam Darnold thing goes, he's going to make $10 million on a one-year contract. That is 25% of what most starting quarterbacks will make in the NFL. That's backup quarterback. It's like, if you're the best backup quarterback in the league, that's around what you make. And not only that, there is some upside potential to Sam Darnold. So I guess you'd have to be paying really close attention though. Cause I noticed that when there are those who cover all 32 teams commenting on what the Vikings are doing, you kind of can see who's really been dialed into this and who's just sort of waking up, looking out the window and being like, they replaced Kirk Cousins with Sam Darnold because there's so much other context to this that you have to go back literally three years to understand how it all led to this point. Well, but also, yeah, and and good on, and good on Kevin O'Connell, right, who's been – in my opinion, one of the best coaches in the NFL the last few years. I know he's not perfect, but to take a team that was incredibly flawed, an 8-9 team, 2021, get them to 13 wins. And I know it was a Mickey Mouse 13 wins, but it was – they won 13 games. Playoffs, then last year they were – they won seven games, but they were competitive the whole year. They kept the fan base in it all year. But there are costs to being a competitive rebuild team. And again, like we're, again, I'm happy. I'm somebody who roots for Quasey. I'm somebody who you know roots for Kevin O'Connell. I want them to do well, but there were costs to do the competitive rebuild. The first cost is that you've watched Detroit pass you up, right? The Detroit's in the NFC championship game um, and they have a ton of cap space and they had a, a ton of draft capital. They have a lot more to work with than you do. They have a franchise quarterback who's, better than about as good or better than Kirk Cousins was and they don't have to make a tough decision on him they have a ton of draft capital they and they can they basically you know all these things that Vikings fans say about oh you know they never hit on a defensive player during the Kirk Cousins era they they aren't the Detroit Lions basically whiffed on every single defensive player they signed in free agency last year and still made the conference championship game because they rebuilt and had the slack to do that Green Bay passes you up because they decided to draft a quarterback with one of their picks as opposed to using it on things like Garrett Bradbury, you know, play, you know, things like that, and play him behind Aaron Rodgers. And now they've comfortably passed the Vikings up. And now Chicago, again, Quasey hired the same year as Ryan Poles. Ryan Poles, now they didn't have as much to work with, so it was an easier decision to do this. But they bottom out. They get the first pick. They trade it. They get the first pick again. Now they're sitting. They get either Caleb Williams or a Hall for the first pick. And they're building out a roster with some pretty damn good players. You are going to be the fifth or the fourth, sorry, fourth best team in this division, regardless of what you did at quarterback. And so in some ways, you know, we're giving Quasey some credit for making a decision that was pretty easy to make at this point in time. But the costs of that of those two years are still going to be felt and about what we're going to talk about in a second, which is you didn't have a ton of draft picks this year because of the, the gear you were competitive and you went in and got Jalen Rager and Ross Blacklock and more importantly, TJ Hawkinson. That left you with fewer draft picks in 2023. And now this year, because you went in on Josh Dobbs instead of just playing, you know, and, and again, Jaron Hall got hurt. So it's not as easy to say, oh, you played Josh Dobbs instead of Jaron Hall. But you were competitive when it, you could have just 
mailed it in and got a better pick. But you are going to have to trade up now to get your starting quarterback in this draft. And that's going to leave you with fewer resources than you would have otherwise had. So there's costs to being competitive. And, and, and those costs are the other teams who are building the war chest while you were winning some meaningless games in Octobers and Novembers are now ahead of you, and you have to play catch-up. Now, good on yeah, – I think that they're going to do the best that they can to play catch-up, but that's what's in front of them right now. And, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to leave, I think, a lot of people with some question marks about what's to come uh, for this team. And I think from the uh, front office perspective, the reason I give some leeway to the overall direction is because it was laid out from the ownership. And at that point, there's really nothing you can do. And I even try to get into the heads of the Wilfs in making that decision to have them run it back and be competitive in 2022 because they looked at what happened in 2021, all the close games that they lost, as miserable as the organization was, they were kind of on the cusp of being a good team and I think they felt like can we at least see it with somebody else in charge because all the players and think about this if you're the owners because we always make this easier because we don't have consequences we don't have to deal with actual people but if you are the owners of the team and Patrick Peterson and Adam Thielen and Eric Hendricks these great great players are coming to you and saying we just need a better culture we're right there we can do it we need a couple more players we can do it just like 2017 I think you could see how instead of being like look sayonara guys great to know you they would say all right we'll give you guys one more chance and they mostly made good on it it still wasn't worth it because they didn't win in the playoffs but i think that they went far enough with their 13 wins to prove that that concept was right that they were a better team than what they got out of that group in 2021 that's not apologizing for the direction i think philosophically we all know tearing it down completely at that point probably was the better idea but it also is relevant that there were other tanking teams in the division. So you looked at it like a free path to a home playoff game, which they got uh, by getting there. Which, so is worth, they had been- which is worth a lot of money in the NFL. And it's worth something to the Wills. And that is something to consider that the Wills value, what the Wills value relative to what maybe other owners or rel- what the fans value. Right. And if they had beaten the Giants, if they get that final drive out of Kirk Cousins, they beat the Giants. I think they would have gone to San Francisco. I believe we all feel like they would have beaten the heck out of the Vikings. But Brock Purdy did get hurt in a playoff game. Like at that point, I would have said, you know what? They were right. They got the playoff win. They went out there. They had a chance. They were on the doorstep. So they they were proven right. It's really the fact that they didn't beat the Giants that I think stings so much. Uh, and then there's, you know, look, it has not been anywhere close close to perfect along the way. And this is what I mean by uh, the direction overall. The macro view has been, I think, really good. The micro, there's a lot that you could take apart, including Daniil Hunter, Houston Texan. That is a mistake that not trading Daniil Hunter in the middle of the season when your quarterback goes down and Kwesi Adafo Mensa mentioned getting texts from players saying, oh, don't trade players, don't tear us down. Sorry, man, that's why you run the team and not the players. And I get it. And even the coach, the same thing. I'm sure that the coach thought we can make the playoffs. Look at our upcoming schedule. You're the coach, not the front office, because the front office is supposed to make more prudent moves. And now if they had an additional second round pick, they would be in much better place as they are in a position to potentially trade up. So there have been mistakes. There have been bad draft picks. There have been some bad decisions. Marcus Davenport signing is really, really a black mark on the record. But when you now have this cheat code of going to get a rookie quarterback, if you make a mistake on a signing, it doesn't ruin everything as missing on Marcus Davenport did for their pass rush last year. And I think that's a key point that they always needed to thread the needle on every signing and every draft pick. So you miss on a cam Dantzler or something, and then you're just up a Creek and have to sign Bashad Breland where, as opposed to now there's more room for error with what this team could do. So I think that just as Rick Spielman was way smarter of a GM when he had Teddy Bridgewater in the rookie contract and he signed Linval Joseph and Captain Munnerlin and Terrence Newman and hit on those free agents. I think that we'll see like all of a sudden, if you, if you make a bet on a Jonathan Grenard or an Andrew Van Ginkle, the, 
Those are way better bets than Marcus well, Davenport. You don't have to make a huge sacrifice in order to get somebody as they did in the past. Well, and look at all these teams that got guards, you know, because – and centers. Like, they had to draft Garrett Bradbury in 2019 because they don't have – they didn't have the resource. The, the Carolina Panthers, you can give the Carolina Panthers a ton of flack, and I will. Um, I don't think that Brant Tillis and, and uh, Dan Morgan should get – crap for what Scott Fitterer did, but you can give the whole organization some crap. But they went out and got Robert Hunt for $20 million a year at guard. And we're all going to be like, geez, that's a, a lot of money. But when it comes down to it, you've already paid $200 million in assets for Bryce Young in that trade. So you're going to have to do, you're going to have to figure out. And then you fold in a Deontay Johnson trade, you fold it and all these things are about supporting your quarterback. And when your quarterback's making up against the cap, and back then, like, I think the Kirk Cousins thing could have worked now where you have void years and you have um, a better coach offensively. I think Zimmer really did not give Kirk much of a chance, whereas I think Kevin O'Connell, to his credit, really nurtured Kirk as a person, which, you know, helped. But you were never going to be able to go out and pay top dollar for a guard. You were never going to be able to go out. They almost had to cut Riley Reef on the eve of the pandemic season because he they were up against the cap. That was your left tackle, guys. And so, I, I, I again, when they come in and they trade up and they get Drake May or Jaden Daniels or J.J. McCarthy, and it doesn't go perfectly this year, they're going to have a humongous amount of cap space to go out next season and find the exact – player to help him out the same way. And everybody, and again, I'm the biggest Patrick Mahomes fan probably in the world, but the chiefs overpaid for Sammy Watkins. They, they, they over like when Patrick Mahomes got the crap beat out of him in the Super Bowl, they went out and traded a first for Orlando Brown. They paid top dollar for Joe Tooney. And that was because Patrick was still on the cheap end of his contract. And now we watched Mahomes, and this season, of course, the offense was terrible, but he's he's the everything, everywhere, all at once. He's past that point. Kirk was never going to be that guy, and so you're always kind of make, making that excuse. The next guy that comes in, whether it's McCarthy or whatever, he's there's just going to be a war chest to be able to support this player, and he doesn't have to be even anywhere near as good as Kirk Cousins for this team to have the kind of success that this team always wanted to have when he was the quarterback. Right. And, you know, we had gone over that so many times of the disadvantage and so forth, but sometimes you really have to see it in action to fully yes. understand. Right. And so it's like, well, yeah, but they made a mistake on this signing or they made a mistake on that signing. And like, OK, let's see what happens once the shackles are off with the salary cap. And once there's all this extra cap space that went into it. And the thing is that with the way that Cousins always designed his contracts, it never had a whole lot of wiggle room because you'll see, well, hey, you know, Derek Carr, Matthew Stafford, they had this low cap hit for this particular season or that season, but the structures were always all guaranteed money. And that makes it very inflexible for them to be able to move around. And you mentioned the dead cap space, but once they take their medicine, then it goes away. And so I remember last year when they did switch Cousins contract around to have all that dead cap money hit at once, I think we were a little confused, like, man, that's going to be so hard for them next year. But now when you see it in the light of day, you go, okay, wait, only 2024, and then it's all gone, it's all disappeared, and there's no more void years that you have to deal with. And the same with, you know, Daniil Hunter and the way they set it up. And then the freedom is truly there for them to work with no bounds that are holding them back. Well, and not only that, but the way in which the cap works and, and the Wills are phenomenal owners. The Vikings are a great franchise with, with, with great facilities and everything. You can, you can borrow from the future. And in fact, it's at a negative interest rate. So everybody's like, well, what if, what, what if the Vikings actually hit on this stuff? Like, they can go if mid season, let's say, if if it comes up that they're actually really good, and let's say JJ McCarthy is him, and they're seven and one or something like that, you can go just because you ate all that dead cap this year, doesn't mean you can't. Oh, this, there's not money to spend here. The Cleveland Browns, the Philadelphia Eagles, 
Um, you know, to a lesser extent, uh, you know, now it's uh, Tampa Bay has been doing it. They were a pay as you go team, but when Brady came, they became more of a uh, spend and prorate team, as we call them. Like you could go to like Jonathan Grenard, or you can go to probably more appropriately, you could go to Justin Jefferson or somebody who has who's you or, or Hawkinson maybe. I think Hawkinson may be the more appropriate one, and go to him and be like, look, we're going to convert the rest of your your week to week paychecks to a signing bonus, spread that out over five years and take that money. And again, you're borrowing from the future, but it's a negative interest rate because the cap goes up every single year. So a dollar later is worth less than a dollar now. It's just that you don't want to do that for no reason. And the Vikings are doing this for no reason for all these years. That's kind of the, that's been like the thing that's always been my issue is you're borrowing 28.5 million from the future just for a very moderate, you're always, and I always joked about this, but they were always like 40 to one. They were 40 to one to win the Super Bowl every year under Cousins. And it's like, so you're borrowing from the future just for that. So just because they're taking their medicine this year doesn't mean that midway through the season, if the thing starts to turn over and become good, that they can't go trade for, you know, a, a corner that's 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 disgruntled or another wide receiver or a guard or something like that. They can do that. It's just that, if they don't, and this season like turns out like if, like nine and eight or something like that, they're going to go into next year with the biggest war chest in the league, and 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 they might end up they might go from being the fourth best team in this division, which they are now, to a favorite. And and that's where when it comes to those buttons to push, once it's time, then you mash them. And, and when I, when I'm talking about the salary cap and this even goes for a trade up type of situation. I, I think that they're tied together. So I want to talk about that because you could start pushing all the void years. You can do whatever you need to do, all the conversions to make sure you get as much cap space as possible. Once you have hit that moment where you are emerging as a team that can truly compete for the Super Bowl, and then you'll pay the bill later, whatever, but you create this two, three year window where you can make it all work. We're going to see Detroit do that when they have to pay people and Chicago do that when they have to pay people eventually. And that's what the Vikings plan will ultimately be. Now, I think that the fact that they've put themselves into a spot where they could have the war chest salary cap wise for next year, where you can be the team that trades for Bradley Chubb. You can be the team that trades for Khalil Mack or Tyree kill or whatever other player that another team cannot afford, uh, not to mention signing them in free agency that allows the Vikings, in my opinion, to trade up with whatever it would take. And I think that over these next few weeks, Kwesi Adafo Mensa, aside from signing a left guard, maybe bring Dalton Reisner back. I don't know. Uh, signing a wide receiver three, you know, filling out these other parts. They've done some of the major stuff, but his phone calls, 80% of them should be to the Arizona Cardinals and the Los Angeles chargers to try to get up ahead of the New York giants to make sure that they can pick a quarterback. And I, throughout this time, Watching J.J. McCarthy, I have been in two worlds of I haven't really seen it of why I would think that he was a top prospect. And yet I also think that if Kevin O'Connell fully buys into him as a leader, as an understander of football and concepts and how to lead an offense and dial it up and then uh, as having attributes that he could develop into a great quarterback that J.J. McCarthy and the Vikings do make a lot of sense as a marriage. There's also a possibility, and it just feels kind of crazy from where we were, that McCarthy has become so coveted that he surprises us, and he's one of the top three picks, even though we have all assumed that it's going to be Drake May. All I know for the Vikings is you better be there in that spot after doing all this to get the guy that you want. And I've been okay. I like Bo Nix. I like Michael Penix. But if it's one of the top four that they absolutely must have, then do whatever it takes to get to number four or to number five to make sure that the Giants don't jump ahead of you. And honestly, if they did it in Trey Lance style, if they did it tomorrow, I would think that that was really great. Like do it now while everybody else is sleeping, get, make those trade calls. Now don't wait until draft night when the prices are going to be extremely high and there's going to be so much competition. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have precedent for that. The jets moved up with the Colts in 2018 for Darnold. Um, I think months, a month before 
or so. Uh, and I remember the Niners moved up with the Dolphins. Uh, basically, that or not, it was, yeah, it was the Dolphins, and it was a month before or so. So we had precedent for that. I think Quasey understands that. And then, of course, the Panthers traded up with the Bears a month and a half before the draft last year. So we, we have precedent for that. I agree. I, I think back to the Brad Childers era, I think back to, you know, when they traded Dante Culpepper and again, Culpepper had a knee injury and ultimately was never the same. So it was smart to trade him. Uh, they got very little in return. And instead of, you know, they could have drafted Jay Cutler. They could have moved up for Jay Cutler. They went with Brad Johnson and then they traded up. You know, people forget they went Cedric Griffin, Ryan Cook in round two they traded back into round three with the two third round picks their own, and they won. They got for Nate Burleson. They trade back and they take Javaris Jackson. I think the fan base, if they went back and got like Spencer Rattler or even Knicks and Penix, I, I like Knicks and Penix, but if they come back in and go and get one of those guys, it's going to be the wah wah. I think that a Tavares Jackson would, would give rise to. So I do think you just got to go up and get the blue chip guy. And that would be kind of my one criticism of Quasi so far, which is he's kind of, you know, in that scene, I'm forgetting Sarah Marshall where Paul Rudd, you know, and, 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 uh, and Jason Seagal are doing the, the, the surfing and he's telling him to do less. And he just kind of like, he's, I think Quasi sometimes does with the, with the quarterbacks just kind of lets the game happen to him. And even with the cousins thing, it was kind of like he did let the game happen to him and good on him for not, matching that deal with the Falcons, but could have been more proactive with Will Levis, could have been more proactive with Kenny Pickett, Malik Willis. And I think in 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 hindsight, he was right on probably all three. I think Levis has some potential. I worry with him though, if you know there's four quarterbacks there, does he have, does O'Connell have a big opinion on any one of those four? Because then I can get to a then I could see a situation where they're like, okay, they have intel that it's going to go Williams, Daniels, McCarthy, and maybe they don't have a big opinion on May, and they let this thing play out, and they're it's a Sam Darnold season. Or they have a big opinion on May, but not McCarthy, and again, it's a Michael Penix draft pick, and we're all just kind of like, ugh. And, and the, the Kirk Cousins people who are wrong get a whole season of peacocking at us because we have to watch Sam Darnold the whole season. And so that's like where I get worried um, because he has not, I think he has great analytical principles, but the one that, that has been, you know, Nobel prize winning economist, Richard Thaler, along with Kate Massey, one of my good friends, they wrote the paper back in 05 saying, basically, if you think there's a huge difference between quarterback one and quarterback two, you're probably wrong. If you think there's a huge difference between quarterback two and three, you're probably wrong. And three and four, you're probably wrong. So if I'm Quasey and I move up to four and then somebody in front of you takes the wrong quarterback, I still think you should take the next guy because if, if the data around this position tells us anything, it's that we don't know a whole lot. We've, we've, you know, you look at the 2021 draft and a lot of that's pandemic, but Lawrence is okay. I think he'll get a second contract. Wilson sucks. Lance sucks. Field sucks. Sorry, Bears fans. Mac Jones sucks. And so, and we all thought that that was a generational class. We weren't all that geeked out about Tua and Herbert, who are much better than those any of those four guys. I, I that's where I get worried. Is I think you should trade up to four and take the fourth best guy. And 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 I know people are going to be like, well, you got to like. The, Kevin O'Connell has already shown a propensity to be able to take a quarterback who's incredibly flawed and win with him. I think that's his superpower. I think if you're Quasi, you lean into that. I agree. And I think that if you are trading up to number four, if you don't draft a quarterback, then what? <laughs> then it would just be complete insanity. But if you're trading up to number four, if you're willing to do it, that means that you are comfortable with whoever ends up in your lap. So I do think there's a world where the New England Patriots could look at J.J. McCarthy and say, you know what? We'd rather have more of a quarterback bot than we do. And that's not to say he can't make plays, but Drake May is a little wild, right? So maybe they'd rather have uh, somebody like J.J. McCarthy that they could plug in their offense and a Michigan winner, then they would prefer someone who's a little more 
toolsy and needs a little more development like Drake May. I mean, you've got to be comfortable with any of those four. And if it's Jaden Daniels, if you end up doing that, then you also have to be willing to completely pivot with the way that you play football, right? So there's got to be plan A, B, and C if you trade up to number four. The question is, how much is that worth? And the the number I've been thrown out is three first round draft picks, the same price as it took to get Trey Lance. And I just think that that is uh, about as high as you can really go. Uh, but even if they went completely crazy and added something to it, it's almost hard to find a price outside of trading Justin Jefferson where I would say, oh yeah, that's too much. If you're going to get your yeah. franchise quarterback and you're set up with all the cap space for the future. But do you have a price that would be too much for the Vikings to pay? In this case, no. So th here's an interesting anecdote, Matthew, just to give you kind of an idea of underneath the hood. How many, like, I think everybody in your, um, everybody in your, <laughs> of your listeners, the best listeners, I would imagine, um, sort of in the, in the um, Vikings territory, right? Um, will, will, they, they use the mock draft simulator PFF. I was part of building that. Timo Riske built a lot of it. When we were first building it, one of the hardest things was building what are called the draft curves, because historically, Jimmy Johnson had the Jimmy Johnson trade chart. And it's named after Jimmy Johnson because he made all the trades, more trades than anybody in the history of the NFL prior to him. Now, it was actually a guy named Mike McCoy who created it, and he created it because of how much every single draft pick actually cost in terms of dollars, which is different now. Remember, when you... When you draft a player now, it gets slotted in as far as uh, you know their cost to um, their cost to the team based upon the rookie wage scale. Um, but back then, you had to actually like pay up for Sam Bradford. Um, one of the things that we ran into when we were when we were creating that is the fact is is if you use PFF WAR, which was the the WAR metric I created uh, to do player value. The first overall pick when it's a quarterback is worth four times as much as the first overall pick when it's another position. And so all of the analytical proverbs about moving back, moving back is almost always plus EV when there's no such thing as a quarterback. When there's a quarterback, moving up is almost it's it's almost always worth doing. And and that's and that's the big thing. So when any everybody ever tells you like there's a tried and true thing or the Jimmy Johnson chart or whatever, it's like, well, yeah, but J.J. McCarthy's probably going to be worth four times as much as the tackle that's taken there or Marvin Harrison that's taken there. And so that's where I think people get a little bit twisted. If you use the Jimmy Johnson trade chart, I'm just going to use that because that's the currency that a lot of teams use. I know Monty Austin for the Cardinals may not use it. And I know Quasey doesn't because he's an analytics guy. The 11th pick is worth 1,250 points. The fourth pick is worth 1,800 points. So to get to that difference of 550 points, that is worth about the 35th pick. So like a top end of the second round pick. So essentially, again, that's not actually that much um, if, you, if you go through and look at that. So now to move up, you actually have to pay a bigger premium than that because you generally speaking don't have the, enough change. But if you're the Minnesota Vikings in this, in this realm, you probably have to, uh, if I'm looking at the Arizona Cardinals here, I think you probably have to give up, you know, 42 and next year's one, you know, just to, and, and if people think that that's a lot, okay. Um, you know, I think you'll probably come in maybe 108 next year's one. 108 is a pick that is worth, 108 is a pick that's worth, yeah, it's not quite enough. Next year's one, it depends upon where you're going, but you, you discount by a round. Yeah, so it's probably 42. And then and next year's two, 42 and next year's one. But that it's not as much as you think. They're not moving up from like 27. You know, when the Chiefs moved up from 27 to 10, and they gave up 91, next year's one, and then they're first. So it's not actually that much. So I, I think what will make it more than all of that that you just laid out is competition. That if the right, teams that D, if the teams that definitely need a quarterback only view it as a four quarterback draft, then you're going to have Denver calling. You're going to have the Las Vegas Raiders calling and everybody's going to want to get in on this party, which I think means the Vikings need to keep turning that dial. And in this situation, and this is only presuming that they think that 
J.J. McCarthy is much better than Bo Nix, much better than Michael Penix. And the reality seems to be that that's the case, uh, or at least depending on who you ask, like some former quarterbacks online like Bo Nix more, uh, I don't know. But if that's how everyone feels, is that it's a four QB draft and the other guys are more of second round draft pick types or late first round types, then you need to keep turning that dial and you need to keep, or if it was a, if it's a bidding war, keep raising your little Viking ship over and over and over until you get it. You need to go so high that somebody else is going to say, all right, we just can't do this because that's the position that you've put yourself in is that you need to come away with that. And it could be costly down the road. Uh, but also if they were like up against the cap, that would be problematic. I don't tend to think that's problematic. So if they went to yeah. three first round picks, I think that that's okay. Even if by all metrics, everyone will say, oh, they got killed on the draft chart. Like, I don't really care about that yeah. at this moment. Just to give you a reference, though, Matthew, when the Niners moved up to three in 2021, they gave up a third round pick and a first round pick the next year, which effectively, if you use kind of the one round discount, is a four and a two that year. And then the first round of the following year, which, again, you use a round discount as a three. So a two, a three and a four to move up to 12 to three. And so you go 11 to four. I do think 42 in next year's one should get it done. But again, if there's competition for it, now there's a couple ways you can view the competition. You can view the competition as everybody's, for lack of a better term, kind of like blown all their bullets on three, right? With New England, maybe that pick gets traded and then everybody's like exhausted for four. Or people might, like, by the time you pick over all those quarterbacks, you get to four. Maybe all the teams don't like that fourth guy either. So I, I wonder about that because you are trading up for the fourth guy. That that is So it's interesting. I, I do agree that it's going to take some picks. And, and obviously, the, you're the Vikings. You know, you may have. But I, I think next year's one and 42, as well as 11, of course, to move up to four uh, is probably – could end up being could end up being the right the right move. Now, analytical draft charts like the one Quasi probably uses are a lot flatter. So what I mean by flatter is it's, you know, he's gonna probably offer less initially because later picks are worth more to him. And just like when, you know, when he traded back from 12 to 32, a lot of people in the league, even though most of the analytical draft chart says, good job, Quasi. The Jimmy Johnson chart said he got beaten in that in that in that pick, and that's probably why they were able to get a strike price between the two. Um, so I actually think that he that might be the Achilles heel here. He's he might not actually get up to that price, and some team might beat him out for it. I would imagine that ownership slash O'Connell slash him will consensus on moving up and and doing what it takes with the price uh, to get up to four. And to me, that's the trade off. Is if Kevin O'Connell wanted Kirk Cousins back, which it seemed like he did, and the front office and ownership said, oh, 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 no, not at that price, then all right, but you better get me my guy. You better get me at least, you know, one of those elite prospects, not Spencer Rattler or something in the middle rounds and hope for development, not Sam Darnold for $10 million, but really get me my quarterback of the future that I can be with for the next 10 years. Because what we know is if you hit on that guy, uh, you have a really good chance of having job security for many years to come unless you blow it like you're the Los Angeles slash San Diego Chargers. Um, so let me ask you before we wrap about uh, Justin Jefferson. There is lots of buzz, and lots of noise. And I just started Googling, Eric. I went and I Googled Nick Bosa contract negotiations. First thing that pops up, an article just before he signed the contract about how the 49ers were botching negotiations with Nick Bosa. I typed in DK Metcalf and there was an article about how DK Metcalf was bluffing about leaving the Seattle Seahawks. He never wanted to leave. He just put it out there to try to up the price a little bit. I found a Debo Samuel trade request. I found a Jalen Johnson trade request. And in my opinion, and this could change as soon as we hang up because the National Football League's crazy. But in my opinion, all of this is just noise that always happens every single time 
a major contract is negotiated with a mega star player that is not a quarterback. Normally with the quarterback, the team knows, <laughs> okay, we just got to give him whatever he wants. But in almost every other position player, you see stories the guy wants out. Now there's the uh, story that, you know, he wants to see how it plays out in the offseason first. Well, that, I mean, sure, because this contract is getting negotiated in August, more likely than not. So it's fine if he wants to do that and wait to see what they do in the draft. But here would be my question, to Justin Jefferson. How do you like playing on two franchise tags? Because that's the rules. So, I mean, would you like your 80 million guaranteed now? Or do you want to try to play it all the way through and uh, see if you're still as valuable on the other side? It makes so much sense for both parties to eventually agree to a massive contract extension for Justin Jefferson. It doesn't make sense to trade him. It doesn't make sense to let him you know, go on the franchise tag or anything else. And I also think it's a total myth that because the Vikings didn't extend him last year, it's going to cost them way more money. I've seen that out there. The salary cap went up a little bit. I guess maybe that's where you could find that. But everybody knew that it was going to be the biggest contract in the NFL for a wide receiver. I don't see how anything has changed really from last year. And it's it just it's it's always a thing. It's like we love drama, yeah. we love trade rumors, we love love pointing at a team and saying, "Look at them screwing up." But until Justin Jefferson is either not playing football games because of his contract or until he's at, well, I guess if they haven't signed it and he's into the season without that contract, I'm just going to sit here and wait and say, all right, uh, I'll wait. I'll wait through all the drama, through all the rumors, through all the let's go live now to our insider to hear the latest on Justin Jefferson. I'll wait through it. I don't think you should have to ride that ride if you're Vikings fans, because much more likely than not, Justin Jefferson will sign the contract extension that we've always thought he was going to sign. Yeah. Also, the cap goes up every three years. Every NFL team has to spend 89% on average of the three-year rolling cap. They're going to spend it on something. Justin Jefferson, folks, the top-end deals in the economy that is the NFL are tethered to the franchise tag which goes up in proportion to the salary cap. Justin Jefferson did not run away because of a year you didn't sign him. It's just going to go up in proportion to how the cap goes. So yeah, you have to pay, but the cost of being an NFL owner is to spend up to the increases in the salary cap. So quit it with this stuff. Like, and it doesn't, and giving Jefferson a 13% increase over what you were going to give him last year is fine because that's the increase in the cap. It was not going to go... It was going to go to something else anyway from the owner's perspective. And I can't think of a better way to spend 13 more percent of your cap than on the best wide receiver that is in the NFL right now. So I, I don't get it. It doesn't make a ton of sense. Jefferson's going to play for this team. In fact, once they see their plan for quarterback, which is to get a young guy who you are responsible for, Jefferson, like you are the author of this guy's career, I can't think of somebody who's more competitive in the NFL than him, who wants that probably responsibility more than him. This is a guy that averages 10 yards a target as a wide receiver in the NFL. It's hysterical how good he is. Of course he's going to want to go. He's accomplished every every statistic he's accomplished in this league. He finally wants to win, and he, and he didn't win here. His quarterback left his team, gave a one-minute, one, out, one 30-second speech, and did not mention once that they didn't accomplish what they signed him to do. Right? This guy wants to win. They're getting closer to that by everything they've done this offseason. They're going to get closer to getting Jefferson here. All that st other stuff is hogwash. I do agree that it they probably should have signed him last year, but they had these instruments. The, the, the great players in the NFL, the blue chip players, you have the first round pick, you're the fifth year option, you have the two, the two folks, if you didn't figure this out by now, the two salary, the two franchise tags. Tether the two-year cash for every single one of these big deals. Like these things are already written. It's all about whether or not you want to guarantee the second year and all this kind of other stuff, which by the way, they should. It's going to get done. I just don't see how they would have gotten that much better of a deal for last year. 
Uh, maybe there's a little more uh, cash involved because of the cap going up. But I, we already knew that it was going to blow everybody else's contract out of the water. And just one more, one more myth to touch on with Justin Jefferson and his potential contract extension. And, uh, you know, like if something changes, then uh, I guess we're going to have a really crazy podcast if it changes. But just for now, uh, is the idea that uh, because they struggled to build around Kirk Cousins salary cap wise, that they will struggle to build around Justin Jefferson's dollar figure? It's very different. Because number one is the structure of a deal for Justin Jefferson. If you sign it now and you can push out some of the money, you can also make it so it can be restructured into the future to lower those salary cap hits, as we just saw with Patrick Mahomes for, I think, the second time already uh, that they have restructured Patrick Mahomes. You could do that. And for a wide receiver, I mean, first of all, I don't even think his salary cap hit will get to 30 million for at least the first three years. So that's one thing. But for a wide receiver, by the time his cap hit hits 30, quarterbacks are going to reach 60. I mean, so I, I just don't think that it, those two things can be connected. They will pay people, but uh, you're going to have Jefferson set up with still a reasonable cap hit, and it won't be massive until years out. And that's the point where you're trying to make it your window to win as well. He's still inexpensive. We saw that with the Philadelphia Eagles and AJ Brown. And so the, the structure of this versus what happened with cousins, where it was all guaranteed is just so much different. So I, th I just think that like this takes so much nuance. And when they, you know, on TV, send it out to whatever reporter for like a 30 second report. It's very difficult to capture like, hold on, I'm going to need like a, a 11 minutes to break this down, Ted or whatever. And uh, you just can't really do that. So, um, but I think that all roads lead to an extension that will look at the first, like it's totally insane. And then they won't be that restricted by it into the future. That that's how I, I feel about this. I don't, I just don't see any real issue with Justin Jefferson signing this huge contract. Yeah, me either. And and again, your quarterback is on rookie deal money. I don't know what his name is, but his, he's on rookie deal money. So like Sammy Watkins was making 16 million a year with Patrick Mahomes and they made a Super Bowl. He was not worth 16 million a year. You have a ton of slack there. And I, I can't think of a, I can't think of a wide receiver cost wise that I'd like to, I'd like to round corners with than, than Justin Jefferson. Yep. And uh, we've seen, you know, people, it's funny how people bring up Tyreek Hill as a reason to get rid of him. Tyreek Hill's a reason to pay him because he's made Tua into one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL statistically. Uh, so wh who's, who's your draft pick quarterback more likely to be uh, the best ever or like a pretty good guy. So uh, anyway, and also Patrick Mahomes had the best offense with Tyreek Hill much better yeah, than they had last year. Anyway, we can go through that all day. <laughs> your young, your your great receivers build up your young quarterbacks, and then yeah, when your young quarterback becomes a great one, the the truly unicorn of which there are like five, then yeah, you trade the receiver. But there's only five. Like the Bills can trade Stephon Diggs if they want to. The 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 Chiefs can trade Tyree Kill. Everybody else needs their wide receivers, and including the Vikings. Right. Even Aaron Rodgers, different guy once Devontae Adams was gone. So anyway, Eric Eager, great discussion of all things Vikings and the plan and a, a interesting new world that we now live in. For the first time in a very long time, you and I having conversations about what is next, a quarterback, and it actually means there's a new quarterback. So uh, thanks so much. Sumer Sports Show uh, is a absolute must listen between you and uh, former GM of the year, Thomas Dimitrov. So make sure everybody goes checks that out. YouTube now on XM Radio as well. Awesome, awesome, awesome stuff. So thanks so much, Eric. And we will talk again soon. Thanks for having me.